Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Hawker Zaffer and this is Redefining AI. Redefining AI is a podcast hosted by Squirrel and the Squirrel Academy. The podcast focuses on key narratives and discussions that drive digital innovation and help people understand artificial intelligence, machine learning, insight engines, and the insights era. Now today, I've been joined by Julien Simon, and I'm super excited about the discussion that lies ahead. Julien is the chief evangelist at Hugging Face, the AI community that is on a mission to democratize good machine learning, one commitment at a time. Now, prior to his engagement at Hugging Face, Julien spent six years at Amazon Web Services as the global technical evangelist for AI and machine learning and served as CTO, VP engineering and large scale startups for 10 years. In this particular role, he led large software and ops teams in charge of thousands of servers worldwide. Today, I'll be talking to Julien about machine learning and the mission that Hugging Face is on to democratize it and what this means exactly. But before we invite Julien into the conversation, I just want to start by setting the scene a little. On the 9th of May 2022, Hugging Face announced that it had raised $100 million in Series C funding, with the following statement being published on LinkedIn by their co-founder and CEO, Clam Delon. Machine learning is becoming the default way to build technology, mostly thanks to open source and open science. But I don't think we're anywhere close to singularity, AGI, Terminator, AI God, if it even exists. I believe machine learning can be used positively today, for example, improve search for better knowledge, sharing, improve translation for lower language barrier, improve social platforms with better content detection, and many positive use cases that we can't predict yet, like bio, biology, chemistry. So it's increasingly important to democratize machine learning with more collaboration and openness rather than the increasing the, rather than increasing the risk of unaccountability, monopoly and power concentration. Now machine learning has important limitations and challenges that we need to tackle now with action rather than with words like biases, data measurement, P2, energy consumption that should be worked on collectively with the whole ecosystem. Accountability towards control. With all this excitement happening just a day before our conversation, I'm happy to welcome Julien to Redefining AI. Welcome, Julien. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening <laughs> to everybody listening. How are you feeling today after obviously the, the announcement yesterday? Uh, well, it, it's it's great news. Uh, we're all very happy that uh, you know we have tr the trust of our investors, and uh, that that gives us a lot of freedom to keep building great stuff for the machine learning community. So, but there's lots of work to be done. So, you know, it, it's it's great, but we we stay humble and we keep working. That's the key thing. Excellent. So, I mean, I've never had a chief evangelist on the show before, so the episode does pose to be a one of firsts in many respects. Now, there's no disputing this, Julien, that your title is identifiably impressive and super cool. And when I think about the term, I immediately associate it with the popular term sort of tech evangelist that was born mm -hmm. with the launch of the, the Mac operating system. So for those who've never really heard of the term itself, what, what is an evangelist and what do you do at Hugging Face as the, the chief evangelist? So I guess you would have as many definitions, you know, as uh, you would have individuals. So I'll give you mine, right? So I think an evangelist um, is the voice of the customer. Um, we, we listen, we, we speak with customers every day. We listen to what they have to say. Um, we understand 
what their pain points are, what their problems are, and and we try to find the best solution that uh, that we can build for them. And we listen what to what they have to say on the product. What do they like? What don't they like? How can we make the product better? And then, uh, you know, we take that stuff back internally and um, and work together with the teams. Uh, it, it's really about you know having one foot inside the company and one foot outside. And I mean, if anything, I will always side with the customer. You know, it's. Uh, um, I mean that. Uh, we don't have a lot of disagreements at Hugging Face, but in my previous role at AWS, we did have a few disagreements over <laughs> the last, you know, six years I spent mm-hmm. there. And you know, I will always side with the customer uh, and uh, and 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 fight with internal teams to to make sure we we build accordingly to what they need. Mm-hmm. So that, that's to me, that's the key thing. You know, I always told teams. Uh, Please consider me as developer number one. You know, I'm when you build something, let me try it. I'll give you feedback, brutally honest feedback most of the time. But it's better that you hear it from me um, um, than hearing it from you know a thousand customers who don't like what we've built. So it's really you know trying to put yourself in the customer shoes, working with uh, your your own products, your own services. You know. Uh, eating your own dog food, so to speak. Yeah, of course, yeah. And being brutally honest about how it works or doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And then again, uh, I guess the last bit is, as as an evangelist, you you walk the earth and meet people where they are. Um, it's been on hold for a couple of years because of uh, COVID, obviously. But I think traveling, meeting people, connecting with communities, you know, online, but preferably in person, wherever they are and particularly in areas where they don't usually get to speak with you or your company is super important. I mean, I always love it when people tell me, Oh, uh, you're the first guy I meet from this company. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. I I got that a lot at AWS. I traveled to a lot of amazing places and uh, you know, when people told me that I knew I was in the right place. Excellent. Now, I mean, you've mentioned their customer obsession, customer centricity, and I know that um, AWS, Amazon, they're very fond of ensuring that employees, that they live by these sort of leadership principles, and that is one of their leadership principles. Is that because of maybe your past that you have this angle of customer obsession, (laughs) customer focus, or is it also something that's important to hug and face yeah, I think it's, you know, uh, obviously Amazon culture is very strong, but, you know, I tend to believe that, uh, you know, you join companies or I guess I always tried joining companies that were aligned with my own personal values mm-hmm. and um, and business values. Um, and, and I guess, you know, for some people, it's an acquired taste, you know, that imaginal culture. But for me, you know, it felt, a lot of it felt very natural. I mean, as a customer myself, I'm very demanding, you know, uh, I'm spending my money and I want to get my money's worth and I want to be uh, taken care of properly. And I think it's only, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just normal that we do the same as professionals. So, um, you know, I think I had this thing in me before joining Amazon, mm-hmm. uh, join, Working for our six years there just made it stronger and proved how valuable and how valid that way of doing business is. And I think uh, Hugging Face uh, it, it does the same. Uh, you know, we are very, very careful about uh, the community and working with the community. The community made us. You know, Ex- yeah. Ex- without yeah. without the, the 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 tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands of users out there, we, we wouldn't exist. So mm-hmm. we, we need to make sure they, they get value with uh, for, from our, our tools and libraries and models. And for uh, commercial uh, customers, you know, it's even more important, right? Mm-hmm. Machine learning is central for enterprise uh, businesses now. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they come to us, they, they like us. So we need to make sure we live up to the reputation and deliver value. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's quite a nice segue as well. So we've spoke about the transition, your experience at AWS. Um, 
I mean, it's admirable in itself what you achieved there. You spent six years there as the global technical evangelist for, for AI and machine learning. You moved to Hug and Face post AWS. What really fueled your desire there to move to, <laughs> to Hug and Face? Well, uh, it's a fair question. I mean, six years is the longest I've stayed at any company. You know, I've been in IT for a little bit now. Um, honestly, I never thought I'd stay six years at AWS. The pace was uh, grueling, I think is the appropriate word. Uh, you know, the travel, well, it was mostly all self-inflicted, right? Uh, <laughs> I want to be clear on that. Uh, but it, it, it was so exciting. There were so many opportunities that it was impossible for me not to try and grab as many as I could. Um, but then again, you know, I was lucky to join AWS uh, and the, the DevRel team at a time where it was very uh, agile. It was a tiny team. It was probably only five or six people at the time. So hardly anybody knew we existed, even within AWS. So we could just pick our battles, fly all across the world, um, you know, have as, as much impact as we wanted. Um, and of course, you know, as time goes by, uh, reality catches up with you, and and some people think it's a good idea to start deploying processes, and and you know I think that was it for me. Uh, people standing in the way of uh, having maximum impact. <laughs> uh, so I'm very proud of what we did here. It's a it's a very good team. The DevRel team is really amazing there. Um, some of the parts of the company I thought were not so good. So. I was. I thought, hey, you know, six years is a good run. Mm -hmm. We're good friends. We're hugging face and AWS are, are uh, partners, yep. and we work, you know, on a weekly basis with them. But I'm I'm so happy to have found another home where I can just run as fast as possible and keep helping people out there and creating value for them. Yeah, that's nice. I mean, let's keep to that thread as well. I mean, the podcast itself, we've titled it The Democratization of Machine Learning. Mm -hmm. And it's a title that comes from Hug and Face's own mission to democratize good machine learning one commitment at a time. So if we want to explore this mission in detail where you can, as you say, run as fast, mm -hmm. fast as you want, I think mm -hmm. it's important that we sort of define a few of the key concepts first that contribute to understanding machine learning and its democratization, Julian. So could you maybe just for the audience give us a, a sort of understanding of what is machine learning, what is natural language processing, and what is text classification? Sure. So machine learning is a technique where you start from data, right, data sets, and, and you apply uh, algorithms to these data sets in order to find complex hidden patterns. Um, up, up until now, I mean, the, the, the traditional way of finding insight in data was to come up with business rules, right? Uh, you know, people eat, eat more ice cream in the summer and people buy more sweaters in the winter. Okay, that, that's a business rule. It's okay, I guess, uh, and it's fair to say people eat more ice cream in the summer, but you know, you could have a very lovely spring day where people want to eat ice cream too, right? So that, I, that business rule doesn't work there. <laughs> uh, so the problem with the business rules, is they're super static. And, and, and obviously, if you want um, more dynamic applications that adapt to customer behavior and, and external factors that you can describe in a data set, then applying algorithms that learn that those complex patterns, which are more complex than ice cream in the summer, uh, you're, you have to do machine learning. And that's a very quick definition. We could talk about it for of course, yeah, write a book yeah, about yeah. it, but that's, that's the general idea, right? Replace static, potentially, and uh, you know, obsolete business rules with dynamic, um, uh, dynamic models that you train re regularly on fresh data to pick up new patterns. Uh, natural language processing is, um, is an area that uh, specializes in understanding natural language. So um, basically text, right? Uh, understanding um, what humans really mean when they say, uh, you know, I want to fly to London. If you say, I want to fly to London, uh, do you mean you're a bird? 
or do you mean uh, you want to go to your nearest airport and fly to London Heathrow using an airplane? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the kind of thing. It's it, it sounds if you say I want to fly to London, you know, yeah, I get it. Um, but uh, um, a, a computer application, an IT application, needs to understand the context behind that. So. Um, NLP requires uh, language models, which are, again, large models that have been trained on mountains of data. Uh, you know, think uh, Wikipedia size, right? To understand the complex relationships uh, between different words and their, the, the underlying concepts. And, and then based on that, you can build lots of downstream applications like translation, uh, classification, which is really... Uh, uh, assigning sentences or documents to particular buckets. Uh, typically, sentimental analysis is text classification, right? You have a million tweets. Uh, you want to find, to find out if tweets are positive, negative, or neutral. Or maybe you want to do emotion detection, right? Is this a, a joyful tweet? Is this a hateful tweet? Is this a sad tweet? Uh, an angry tweet, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so that's typically what classification is, you know, uh, training models on, on a bunch of uh, uh, examples that you've labeled. Okay, so here are, you know, 10,000 joyful tweets and 10,000 angry tweets, etc. So learn the patterns in there based on your language model. And then when I'll throw new samples at you, you can tell me, you know, what's what pretty much. And there are, this is just one example. Uh, text classification is probably the, I guess the number one uh, NLP application out there today. Yeah, sure. I mean, it reminds me as well. So uh, I, I'm a corpus linguist and I actually did the same thing manually. <laughs> so I did yeah. the whole same process. I built a huge corpora from Facebook, Twitter, and then exactly. I analyzed certain sentiment in the, in the corpora, um, which is interesting now that we've moved on to obviously the processes and possibilities, capabilities that are made possible through through machines. So if you think of, because I'm sure that a lot of people might question this as well, when you think of natural language processing, you think of language, but the system isn't built on language. So how is the language encoded? How are the models built and how, how are they dealing with that? Well, that's really the, the main issue, uh, isn't it? Uh, you have to build those language models. So first of all, you need the corpus of, of data uh, to, to start from. So, you know, I mentioned Wikipedia, but there are other data sets out there. And let's not forget, you know, it's definitely not just English. I mean, you know, on the Hugging Face Hub, which is the uh, our website where we host the models and the data sets, we have models for, you know, 180 languages uh, and it's growing every day. So uh, you need to have that corpus of data and building that is, um, you know, it's not it's not easy. It's as as you mentioned. There's a lot of manual work uh, in in machine learning there. So once you have that data, then you need to do initial training, and this is um, typically a, a training job that will last for you know weeks, potentially months, really. Uh, actually, at the moment, we're Erging um, uh, Face is is uh, co leading. Um, a huge open science project called Big Science, mm -hmm. uh, which aims at training um, a really, really large <laughs> uh, language model um, on, I think it's 42 or 43 languages. Wow. And, and the training started uh, at over a month ago, and it, it's probably going to continue for you know at least a month, maybe a little more. And this is running on a few hundred GPUs, right? So it's massive. Massive. Um, it's a massive effort, and and the goal here is to build an um, an open alternative to uh, Open AI's uh, JPT three model, which, okay. which I'm sure you've heard about. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Microsoft acquired the license for that, so uh, it's uh, you know it's kind of a closed model now. So we're trying to create that alternative, and that's initial training. So it's a massive effort, uh, and uh, because obviously it's. You know, it takes a lot of time and, and, and you know, and fine-grained learning to understand all the nuances in, in those languages. So that's the initial model. But the good news is once you have that, once large teams, large organizations have done that, then we can grab those, those models 
and, and use them for downstream tasks uh, in a very easy way uh, without having to go through that massive training process again. Mm -hmm. Is there any limitations? I mean, what, what are the main limitations with language-based models? I mean, they're quite advanced. I mean, I think that language models are some of the most advanced. Um, in your opinion, what issues might need to be addressed in the near time, near term, or is there limitations that you see you have to take, you might have to take a different approach um, from the angle of machine learning and how you're addressing them? So I guess that at the lowest layer, the, there's a technical challenge, right? There's a machine learning engineering challenge. You know, how do you build and run uh, a massive uh, training cluster <laughs> for weeks or months, right? Um, how do you how do you make sure you that thing is performing at 100% efficiency if possible? So there's a there's a bit of nuts and bolts uh, to be to be dealt with. But I would then I think generally the, the problem is having large models uh, that are uh, you know just powerful enough to learn um, again all the finer details um, and, uh, and 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 you know reflect the complexity of human language and potentially in in, in the big science case um, tens of different languages. Um, so that's you know it's that training could blow up. Yeah. You know, we you know it's it's like it's not a given that it will complete successfully. It's it's what makes it exciting. It's going well so far. You can actually track the progress on our website, but it could just blow up because it's uh, you know uh, it's uh, uncharted territory. What we're, what we're trying to do here, um, I think, for a more uh, um, philosophical perspective, you know, you you also want to make sure those models are, uh, you know, are not biased, uh, are, have no um, major problem there. Uh, and you know, this is really this is I mean the the whole ethical AI and uh, area is still very much you know research territory as well. Um, so you can take precautions, you, you can source very diverse data sets, you can compute some diversity metrics on your data, and having many different languages in there is going to help, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, you, you, really, you really don't know until you, you have the final model and you can test it and make sure, you know, it doesn't discriminate a certain uh, a certain group of people or a certain, you know, there are so many angles to this. It's it's pretty complicated. Sure. I mean, there's so many angles that I could follow in conversation there as yeah. well from the philosophical angle or um, let, let's look at, at the democratization. I mean, because that fits into sure. a philosophical uh, question and understanding. So in, in terms of democratization, are you limiting it? just to opening access to models or are you also incorporating the education around the intrinsics that you've just mentioned about maybe risk management ensuring that the AI is ethical that there's mm. a minimal um, inclusion of certain biases maybe the consequences of certain model implication uh, implications on implementation you know, it's quite a big task that has a lot of philosophical roots mm. and sociological roots involved in it. Yeah, well. absolutely. So again, you know, I'll give you my definition. And uh, um, going back a few years, you know, I, I worked in a different, um, in a number of companies. And uh, I mean, some of them were doing pretty heavy machine learning. And, and I'll give you, I'll share an anecdote here. I think it's the first time I actually share it publicly. So I won't name the company. <laughs> People who know me can easily figure this out. Um, but I, I joined a, a company. I was VP engineering there. And, uh, and uh, you know, on the first week, you know, you do the usual onboarding stuff and you meet the, the you know, the different managers of the different teams and the, and the team leads, et cetera. And then I got to, you know, uh, I got to speak with the guy leading the, the machine learning team there. And, you know, I introduced myself, et cetera. And I, I'd been in the company, I literally, I think, two, three days. And, uh, and you know, I, I was obviously very curious what that team was doing. It was pretty central to the company. And, the, you know, and the guy looked at me and said, and I quote, 
verbatim, uh, why should I waste my time explaining to you what I'm working on? End quote. Um, needless to say, we had a pretty rocky relationship over the last over the next few years, and and that didn't stop me or my team from doing our job. It just made it difficult. And the reason why I'm sharing this anecdote uh, is because the one thing I do not stand is that elite, you know, ivory tower mentality. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not just the machine learning community who's suffering from that. It exists every single, in every single place, right? Every single trade in the world. But I think for machine learning, it's particularly dangerous because it's it's life-changing technology. It's very powerful technology. And the last thing we want is that some kind of self-proclaimed elite you know, just um, has full control over this. And it's true for individuals and it's true for companies. So my fight, so to speak, you know, some would say my crusade over the last six, seven, eight years has been to help the little guy out there work on machine learning. And when I say the little guy, I mean that in the most respectful way. Mm-hmm. Right, and it's the little gal as well. Okay? Exactly, it's, I was just going to say that. It's like the it's little guys and the little right? kiddos. And... I mean, if you're yeah. if you're a young student, all uh, right, if you're a, a freshman at the university, um, and you know maybe you're a business student, maybe you're a, you know you're a humanities student, maybe maybe you're a software engineering student, but you're not going for the machine learning PhD, right? You have the rights. You know, and I'll go and probably say you have the duty to get educated on machine learning and understand what this technology is, what it means, you know, write a bit of code yourself, um, understand the social impact, the technical impact, the business impact. And and the only way you're going to do this is if people build simple tools that everybody out there can use. Okay. And and out of that, you know, comes education and awareness on what this technology is and isn't. And Clem said, no singularity and no terminators. And thank you, Clem, for saying that. Uh, I think it's we need to hear more of that uh, and debunk all those silly um, fantasies about AI and machine learning. Um, so education is best. And some people will actually learn enough to build great apps and great services and, and you know, change the... Uh, change the world or change a little bit of the world, right? Uh, and, uh, and that's exactly what we need to do. So we do need experts. We do need expert machine learning engineers. We need expert data scientists. We need expert researchers to advance science and, and state of the arts. But we need millions of developers and entrepreneurs and business people out there to grab this technology and build mm. amazing stuff with it. And to me, that's what democratizing means. Right. And everything that comes with it. So build tools that, you know, will work, you know, uh, build tools that will improve the situation and not make it worse. So there comes that bias and ethics discussion again, you know, make sure you give tools to people that will help and not hurt. Yeah, which is like a fantastic and admirable cr- crusade. I mean, I can sense your enthusiasm here talking to you. And <laughs> yeah, I feel very, very strongly about this, mm-hmm. as you can see. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So it is. I mean, you're taking on Julian, you and, and the team as well at Hug and Face. Um, it's like a social responsibility. I mean, you're moving it. You want to move it in, in a positive direction, create awareness and make sure that people are aware of the the social and the technical implement implementations so where do you see the line of the, your own social responsibility start and, and ending with the publication of of all these models so i think it's um the first thing i mean the probably the, the number one thing to do is to again raise awareness on the potential issues um that could be lurking uh, in in those models. And I mean, obviously no one wants to train biased models. I mean, I, I've never met anyone who told me, oh, you know, I want to build a racist model, 
well, no, of course not, of course you know, not. or I want to build a, a, you know, a model that discriminates uh, people living in this part of the country. Of course not. Okay. I mean, I, I cannot imagine that exists. Okay. But that can still happen because your, uh, you know, your data set um, was built in a certain way or, or the, the model was trained on a data set that was just an incomplete or partial or, uh, you know, uh, view of reality. And, and again, this wasn't built with, you know, bias in mind. It's just that I, 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 the, 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 the way this what was put together is just, uh, is just wrong, you know, it's just wrong. And, uh, and the problem, you know, is that if, if a data set has, uh, you know, uh, a majority of um, samples describing a certain group of people, obviously a lot of those issues come from personal information you know, sensitive attributes like gender, you know, ethnicity, uh, income, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, well, you know, if you have, uh, if you have lots of information on if 90% of the data set describes a certain group of people with certain attributes uh, and only 10% uh, describe another group of people with different attributes, then, you know, it's likely your model will pay more attention to the, uh, uh, the majority group. Right, because that's how algorithms work. Um, they pay more attention to what they see most of, and so they're not going to do such a good job predicting with the rest. So it's educating people on okay, these issues are, uh, you know, there, there's no evil master plan to build bad models. It's just the way algorithms work. Um, this class of problems can happen. So pay attention to that. Take a look at your data. Uh, you know, you can probably, you know. Uh, um, uh, work on the data a little bit to to mitigate those issues, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So awareness is key. And I think the next step would be to build tools that automatically compute, you know, quality metrics, bias metrics. Uh, and then the next step would be to tell you, okay, this, this, these are the problems you have with this model or this data set. And this is how you can rebalance it, right? So potentially identify additional data sets that you should train on, fine tune on to kind of, you know, reset the scales. Uh, but yeah, again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, whole, uh, a whole research area. And there's a completely different angle to this where uh, you'd say, uh, maybe in some cases, you know, we shouldn't use AI at all. Right until we're happy that uh, quality is near perfect, mm -hmm. you know what's at stake is so important that maybe we should keep humans in the loop. And the humans are not perfect, obviously, as as we see every day. Um, but some things may be just too sensitive to be completely delegated to AI and scaled with AI. I think the scale problem is, is uh, you know, if a human makes mis 10 mistakes a day, okay, that's bad. If a machine learning model makes 10 million mistakes a day, that's awful. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought about that as well. And I suppose it's that different angle of questioning the human in the loop and its actual role. I mean, if we think about, if we go back to language models and we look at how maybe if, a, a, a la if language is crucial to making meaning in, mm -hmm. in the future if computer programs <clears throat> rather than humans are creating content that in turn shapes and impacts the human psyche in society, then this also would create a critical shift and change to the use and impact of language. So if we take out the humans, that would have much more like controversial or interesting consequences as well. I mean, where are you in alignment in the opinion of the progression of keeping humans in the loop? And Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's critical. And, uh, and you know, over the last few years, I've met with a lot of large customers who use AI and ML for, you know, very sensitive things like, uh, you know, credit scoring and, uh, you know, loan, uh, you know, loan decisions or healthcare. And, um, and all of them, you know, I, I think, uh, 
did keep humans in the loop. Um, they, they use AI to, you know, to increase throughput. Some decisions are, I would say, easy decisions, right? And, and so those can be made with AI with a very high confidence score, mm-hmm. okay? And for, for some of those decisions, you know, it's, it's kind of a gray area, you know? Uh, if you have 99.99% confidence in that prediction, that's pretty good, right? If you have 80% or even 90%, is that good enough, right? If you're using uh, AI for uh, cancer uh, detection, is 90% good enough? I mean, would I want a doctor to tell me that there's that I have cancer if there's one chance in 10 is wrong? Or maybe the, the other way is even worse, right? It's like, oh, no, 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 you're totally fine. Mm. And, you know, and there's actually one chance in 10 that I, I, he's wrong and I'm sick. And, you know, I have a really bad, you know, uh, really bad time a few weeks later. So um, I think that's all about, that's where the responsibility lies, you know, figuring out where to draw the line between, okay, you know, uh, we have multiple models predicting in parallel and they all say that 99.9% is is the confidence here so yeah you can automate that um even you know uh, 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 i mean uh, a human could still look at it really quickly and say yeah okay that's click fine move on mm-hmm. but for you know for like less confident predictions you want humans in the loop and uh, and i think that's the best of both worlds and i see a lot of companies doing that um even for you know less uh critical use cases it's just a good way to speed up all the easy ones and focus your human talent on the hard ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly agree. I think that we're still at that stage at the moment. Um, I mean, there's a lot that say that machine learning is magically simple and that it can be used to solve all of the existing outstanding problems. Um, are you in the opinion then that uh, machine learning is magically simple and that it can be successfully democratized so it's not magic <laughs> um you know i it's uh i mean superstition yeah, is in my opinion always bad and uh it's the engineer talking i guess and it's i think you, you, it creates all those wrong perceptions you know, one thing that aggravates me is when I see all those AI articles with robot pictures. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As Same, I know, I completely no, agree. no, 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 yeah. no. Robots are amazing. They're completely, uh, that's completely different. Okay. And, uh, you know, we're very far from actually have, you know, having meaningful AI powered robots. Um, so machine learning is, you know, it's math and computer science and statistics and data analysis and software engineering and infrastructure, okay? None of it is magic, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Although, you know, it, 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 it looks like magic sometimes. And if, we can, if, if the magic is in putting all those pieces together and building tools, you know, that are high quality, in the sense that they're trustworthy tools, right? They will do the right thing, mm. you know? They will predict the right thing with a very high confidence score. And if we can make them simple enough that your, you know, again, first year university student can, can use them or uh, an accountant can use them or uh, a marketing person can use them or uh, an HR person can use them and build smarter, you know, faster, uh, high quality business apps than we want, okay? To me, that's, the ma- that's where the magic should be. The magic is not in the tech. The magic is how do you take all those pieces that are reasonably complex and hide the complexity so that, you know, the everyday person can use them. And there are lots of really cool apps. I mean, you know, on, on, on our smartphones, you know, most of the cool apps we have there are machine learning powered and no one thinks twice about it. And no, honestly, no one cares. I mean, sure, 
I'm curious how Spotify does, you know, music recommendation and, and, and et cetera. But most of all, I want to enjoy my music. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm really happy when they suggest a, a, an obscure band that I didn't know about. And, and that's why I'm a paying customer, you know, and I will be for the foreseeable future. <laughs> so Good. that's the magic in ML, you know, create those great user experiences um, that, you know, make your life just, you know, uh, a, a, better, uh, a better life, even if it's just tiny things like enjoying music. Yeah, uh, and, and I think that's the key. And I mean, that takes us full loop herself. I mean, at the start, we spoke about your um, customer obsession, the customer centricity. And in here, we're looking at the evidence of the actual output machine learning. We took the example of Spotify and showing that it really is about that enjoyable experience that we're creating for, for the customer. And that's what is admirable just in that scale, but in mm -hmm. also much larger scales. Yeah, and you know, I keep saying, you know, my goal is to to make machine learning as boring as possible. <laughs> you know, I, so I'm working very hard to put myself out of a job completely. <laughs> cool. And uh, you know, there will come a day when you know machine learning is just as um, transparent and and you know just invisible as um, you know computer storage or. <laughs> Or, or, you know, or, or electricity or, you know, running water. It's just there. It's there when you need it. You don't need to know how it works. It makes your life easier and, and more fun and, and safer and, and all that good stuff. And, and then, you know, it's, uh, and then, yeah. And that, that, that's my, that'll be my major victory. <laughs> well, I wish you well with that, Julia. And uh, I think it is admirable. Um, we've also here at Squirrel got a couple of models on Hug and Face um, sure. that I hope everyone would love to try it as well. Um, I could talk to you for ages, for hours. I mean, I well, think it's such a <laughs> fascinating subject. Um, I've got so many questions myself. I find that the whole the whole field and everything that's been motioned uh, by yourselves as well really um, credible and admirable. Um, we're going to have to unfortunately close our discussion though. Um, and I just want to take the opportunity once again to thank you for the valuable contribution today. I'm sure that everyone listening will, will really profit from the depths that you've gone into. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks again for, for having me and thanks for the opportunity to, to reach out to your listeners. Uh, thanks to everybody out there for listening. And if there's anything I can help you with, you know, there's still a bit of work until ML becomes as uh, simple as uh, uh, electricity and running water. So uh, just get in touch. I'm, you know, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn and anywhere else. So just reach out and, uh, and I'm happy to talk to you and, uh, and connect you with the right folks at a hugging face to, to help you build cool stuff with uh, machine learning. Thanks again, Lauren. Great. So thank you for listening today, everyone. And if you want to find out more about Squirrel and the Insight Engine, then go to the Squirrel Academy on learn.squirrel.com and access our educational material. Thanks.